and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work we did um, about nutrient density. So in Wisconsin, um, we've been having a lot of issues with um, some of the lake water quality with phosphorus and then some issues with groundwater and pathogens, et cetera. And some of the issues have been determined to be that we are densifying a lot of our operations within um, a certain areas of the state. And so we're not getting manure distribution to the areas that we want. So we're trying to look at systematic ways in which we can try to improve um, the pathways for distribution. So I'm going to start with like the like kind of proof of concept study that we did. And then I'm going to show you some of the things that we're working on now. Um, I will say that uh, I was hoping to be through another two sets of data, but I didn't, didn't quite make it that far. So the whole concept of this, I think, is that at the farm level forever, we've been looking at nutrient management systems and how do we plan. But what we're recognizing in some areas is that when you start integrating a watershed, we don't have a lot of great ways to look at how we're balancing nutrients on a larger scale. Um, and what we were seeing in some places, and I'll talk to you about this when I look at manure storages, is a lot of people in their plans and stuff were claiming, well, I have another three, 800 acres somewhere. And I started thinking maybe it was the same 300 acres for everybody because it was almost seemed uh, infeasible that there was this much land base that everybody was claiming. So we know in our area, one of the particular things that's concerning in this little base area that we studied is phosphorus. It's our lakes around where Madison is are like some of the most studied lakes in the world because we have limnologists and everybody loves to study them. Um, and we have a lot of algae there, a lot of algae blooms. We know it's related um, to the runoff and you can see the direct correlations there. Um, there's been a lot of like budgeting done on a watershed basis where people were trying to look at phosphorus budgets or using SWAT models or other things, but we're still not really getting any movement and we get stuck kind of debating these <coughs> numbers and lacking kind of a way to find a path through some of that. I'm doing some of this quick because I think everybody in here kind of knows some of the background and I'd rather talk a little bit about the data. But that's been studied a lot. We know that there's certain days of the year, certain times of the year um, where a lot of our loading comes into the lakes. We know that the loading is directly um, related to our algae blooms. You can kind of see it. We see in drought years, the response is actually pretty quick that the lake can improve its concentrations when you don't get a lot of runoff. So drought years, the lake actually looks pretty clean. And then in those other years, we have pretty high phosphorus concentrations. So this is the probably the most terrible slide I put up here. But they, when we started this project, this, the county is actually the one that gave us the money to do it. And so they gave us some very specific instructions. I would say I wasn't so into what they wanted to do, right? They thought the problem was winter spreading and that if we eliminated winter spreading using ad additional manure storages, we could solve the problem. But what we needed to convince them was all of these little practices that we're doing, which limit transport, is critical, but this whole balance of nutrients is really important. And what we could tell is that the balance was way off, right? And no matter what you do for transport minimization, we're never going to really have an impact until we start addressing that nutrient balance part. So I would say we still need to do all of those things, right? But we need to stop the idea that one practice is going to solve our problems. I mean, it's like every two years, we, let's do cover crops. That's going to solve our problem, right? All of these things are important, but they're not going to solve the issue that we have. And uh, interestingly, I had told them when I went started doing research about what they wanted, 50 years ago, somebody had done a study looking to integrate storages in the area to reduce the P-loading, right? So I don't want to go another 50 years and someone, hey, let's do storages again, right? We need to kind of change our mentality a little bit to try to figure that out. So this is our watershed area, um, the Hara watershed. Uh, Madison is located right kind of in the middle here. Um, and so we have these lovely lakes. Um, it spans three different counties, um, although the majority of it is in Dane County. We've got a lot of crop production, although we do have the city within there. Um, but we have a lot of uh, cows, mostly dairy, but we have some other animals in there, including swine and sheep. And so we used a lot of the numbers from the agricultural census to kind of determine what those were. 
but then we also supplemented that with a lot of the county staff. Now, I'll tell you later why when we're expanding this work, it's really tough. This is a highly studied area. So we were able to start with a base of farms and then we used driving around and Google Maps to like image where farms actually were and fill in the holes and until we know here are all where our distribution of livestock farms are and we have a pretty good idea how many animals are on each of these farms. It's not perfect, but it is way better than anywhere else. You're not gonna get this kind of data for the entire state, right? Um, so what we found is that you can see the densification in this watershed is all in the north. Right? And in the south, there's a lot of um, grain uh, production, but we don't have a ton of animals down there. So you can see what, I mean, even looking at this map, you get the idea of what maybe some of the problems are. So we tracked and we got all of our animal numbers um, for the whole watershed. Then we decided we were gonna really study intensively that area and its distribution, right? Because in reality, we know you're not gonna transport manure very far, which is why we're leading into this problem anyway, right? So those, far, those farther along places that are 20 miles away, it's unlikely that people were gonna move much of their manure there. Um, so we found all of the animal numbers. We looked at phosphorus production. So we just calculated phosphorus production per um, the pounds per year, just based on the numbers that we had from all of the animals. So we did the whole watershed. We also did that upper Yahara watershed study area. You can see the majority of the animals there. I think 80% of the phosphorus in the animals are in that kind of um, targeted area up in that land base. Um, and so then we mapped that. So you can see all of this uh, phosphorus production kind of mapped into that study area. Uh, then uh, we looked at the classification of the, so that we could determine crop uptake. So the idea here was you look at 10 years of data, and Mahmoud will talk later if you wanna know about how to do these balances, a little more about how he did this. Um, but, so you can go see his presentation, but he took some um, land cover classifications and then took, uh, I wanna say carp C, and if, uh, to determine over a 10 year period through the rotations how much crop uptake there was of phosphorus, right? So then we mapped that so you could see the rotations uh, and you had the uptake for each of these kind of parcels. So now we could do the phosphorus balance, right? We have the production and we have the uptake of crops. Now this isn't including any other sources of phosphorus, right? Which we do have, we have a wastewater treatment plant that applies all of their phosphorus in the area, but we were really focused on manure phosphorus because the wastewater treatment plant actually focuses on that lower area for application where there's not competition with a lot of the uh, livestock farms. And so this is a little bit small, but the interesting thing to me was that when we started looking at this, we had this 2012 and 2013 data where we said, all right, let's look at the balance of the manure produce versus the crop uptake of phosphorus. So this would where we would be at even base. And now we know a lot of our soils are overloaded, so actually we need to drive underneath the balance to try to correct some of our soil issues, but let's just look at it like this. So in some cases, in the county, we never saw a year, so this was a drought year, so there was less crop uptake, so these numbers are gonna be a little bit worse than maybe a typical year. So we'll just focus on 2013. Where in the county, you see, we never hit this kind of overbalance, right? We were always below, there was a lot of enough crop uptake for the manure we're producing, which makes sense. We don't import a ton of feed. But now here in the Yahara River watershed, it's getting worse, so that whole big watershed. And then in that upper watershed, we're over the balance just with manure, right? And I know some of the crop, or the livestock producers will say they're moving manure, you know, 25 miles, but obviously with the buildup of phosphorus we're seeing, there's other evidence that this is suggesting this is correct. Now, I don't like to get into an argument over if it's 1.5 or 1.25, but the fact is even if we're close to one, that's too much, right? I mean, we can't be that close um, and have all of these other sources of phosphorus in the watershed and we're never gonna hit a balance in that way. So for this particular project, um, they wanted us to look at manure storages. So we looked through the database of existing manure storages. I'm always kind of mind boggled that the data, it was literally just a filing cabinet. So we spent a lot of, uh, you know, I earned my PhD to look through filing cabinets of endless amounts of data, but it was really useful and interesting sometimes. I like to do it for a little bit because it 
you, you get to see a little of what is actually happening out there. Um, it, it, I'd had to say we had to make a lot of recommendations at how some data is collected because it's not collected so great. But we went through a lot of the manure storages. Um, we cross-referenced a whole bunch of it. We did visuals using imaging or inspection. I mean, there was a ton of data. And so then we mapped those storages out there. Um, what we did, you can see, th there was quite a decent amount of storage. We actually don't have a lot of permitted facilities in this area. Even though there's a lot of animals, there's probably only a handful of permitted facilities. We, we generally, around this area, have a lot of small farms. So not everybody has storage. So we know that there were about 80 of the 208 operations that had storage. Um, and then we looked at kind of that distribution and how big they were. And obviously the larger producers all had, um, uh, all had capacity, but then obviously as you got to smaller producers, uh, most of them did not have capacity. So we didn't wanna just say, look at where the manure is. We don't, we have limited money. And so we decided, yep. Can I interrupt? Can yeah. you go back to the previous slide and reiterate what you just said about small producers? Yeah. So, I mean, they're not required to have storage, so they, a lot of them didn't have storage, a lot of the small producers. Understandably, it's a cost they just can't incur. I think we all knew that, but we know the larger producers are required to have storage. So we, we know 100% of them. And as you get smaller and smaller, the number uh, the amount of animal units covered under the amount of storage they have um, decreases. Um, so we didn't want to just look at, do you have storage or not? We have very limited money in the county. If we tried to overcome all of that storage capacity, it would cost us way more than the county would want to invest, right? We gave them a number. I can't remember what that is at the moment. And so what we did was we decided, well, we want to put storages where there would be more impact to the actual land application, right? So we wanted to look at putting storages in areas where there were what we classified as sensitive fields, which we said would lead to increased potential increase of runoff when land applied, so that it would give a in kind of maybe a better estimate of where you might want to spend your money more wisely, right? So we could run it just for the money if we wanted to, but we're now going to add this an, uh, additional component in. So we mapped where all these sensitive fields are using these kind of constraints. If you're within 300 feet of a water feature, if you had an intermittent stream, if you're in this uh, dominant soil hydraulic group is D, so it has high runoff potential, or you had a high field slope, right? Um, and then we eliminated fields that were internally drained. So it's not perfect, but uh, what running. Does that, what does that mean by fields? Why did you eliminate fields that were internally drained? Because we didn't think that those fields would lead to surface runoff, so we eliminated them from the class, from the sensitive field classification. Um, so, in this area, you can see kind of the map, right? Here's the map. Here's the fields that we said were sensitive and then no sensitivity. Now there's a million other ways you could do this. You could use nutrient management plans and try to use like phosphorus runoff numbers or map everything. This wasn't a very big project, so we did it this way because there's a ton of assumptions you're making here, right? You have no idea how the field is managed. You have no idea how, what practices they're using, what the existing phosphorus concentration is, right? So we just said yes or no, we're gonna try to improve the, where these are laid out. And then we ran a lot of optimization models with this, uh, uh, what a, it's like a two-part optimization model. Um, and so it had the economic drivers. It also had this sensitive field driver, right? And so we set up these different scenarios where we're trying to balance, all right, if I'm gonna put in $5 million worth of storage, where would the, where would the optimization system locate that storage to improve the distribution to sensitive fields while also minimizing cost, right? So we end up, and I kind of hit it because I don't want the individual to be identified, but all over and over, no matter what scenarios we ran, it put the storages of where you should invest your money in a very tight spot in both of these places, right? So it knew that we had a lot of excess uh, manure production in those areas for the land base, and then it knew also that those fields would be sensitive. Okay. Um, I know I'm gonna run out of time. So the next thing we did was we met, we took one of those scenarios and we tried to use actually a, what we use in our state is SNAP Plus, which is a phosphorus um, uh, index 
system and we tried to estimate what the impact would be to winter spreading if you went through these. Now again, you don't know the practices, you don't know a lot of the things, and even though we were mapping the particular fields, this is just an estimate, right? But at least it gives us an idea of what might happen. And so we did two of them to kind of bookend this at high, low erosion and high erosion. So in the high erosion, we chose all the practices that would lead to increased loss, and in the low erosion, we chose a bunch of practices that would lead to uh, uh, minimize that phosphorus loss. So in this scenario, our difference when we, in, when we input the storage was about 8,000 pounds each year of phosphorus difference, right? Or maybe this was over 20 years, I'm sorry. And then the difference here was 4,000. So that's a huge range. We're talking 4,000 pounds to 18,000 pounds. Who really knows in that range where we're at? But that is the impact of spending um, this, I, uh, I can't remember now if this was five or $19 million, uh, I apologize. Yeah, 19 million gallons of story, 5 million, thank you, of um, the application. So it kind of gave us an idea. We could determine they really wanted a dollar per pound kind of number. We kept telling them that this is a huge range, and we gave them the range. But it actually, they liked to see it, even though we know it's not perfect. It's what you're going to see. So they could compare this now to other technologies. Now, I don't love this, it wasn't perfect, but it was our first kind of way of trying to integrate these different things into the optimization models, which was, I, I have to say, it was a lot of uh, rough discussions to get through. It hurt my brain a lot. Um, so then we moved on, and uh, I, I, we had a whole team. I worked with the optimization model. His, his name is Victor Zavela. He's a brilliant guy, and he'd give you slides like this. But we decided to do something different where we tried to look at um, if we try to put a price point on phosphorus and allow different tech manure processing technologies, what kind of technologies would you integrate at what scale in the watershed to increase uh, export of phosphorus out of there? So we, he designed this market clearing. It's similar to how they designed the e uh, energy market, right? So there's, there's consumers and suppliers, and you can set different price points, and you provide all of the information. So here's a bunch of technologies, and here's how much they cost and their operating costs, and then you can provide some environmental data or her, however on the other end that you're using. So in this particular one, we allowed separation, granulation, and struvite recovery. So those were the technologies that the optimization model had to integrate. And then we ran all these scenarios. Um, and the only uh, few things I want to point out here is in one scenario, this is separation. There was never really a price point that separation that it started moving manure around with that kind of separation, right? And so these other scenarios, this scenario here and this scenario here allowed um, any of the technologies to be used but changed the demand for it, right? So when you increase demand, we had a lower price point to hit that you would have to supplement. And I'll explain this in a second. I think this, I probably should have led with these other slides. So, <laughs> forgive me, this is the first time I'm talking about this. So, the manure movement, if you just tried to man move manure without processing at all, and you gave it a zero dollar per pound, almost nothing would move, right? These blue lines represent movement. Almost nobody would move manure to an area that needed, based on the phosphorus balance, right? <laughs> Now, if you increase that to $30 per pound, we started seeing the optimization model integrating certain processing technologies. Um, and so you would see this move. Actually, this one was still just manure movement. If you gave them $30 a pound, they would move the manure for phosphorus. Now, when we use the imbalance, so those imbalance numbers that we predicted, and then we also used the um, data for, for the processing technologies, at $0 per pound, you can see this kind of dark color means there's imbalance still, right? The phosphorus imbalance, the scale came off of this one, I'm sorry. And then as you increase price, the imbalance starts to go away. So it's starting to implement different technologies to increase the movement out of the watershed. And then when you get to $30 a pound, there's only a little bit of balance. And in this scenario, we had to raise the price to $45 a pound to reach a balance of manure in the in the uh, in this watershed area, I will say once you started saying so. In this case, this was our um, clearing prices um, of when you tried to hit a balance. So this is at forty-five dollars per pound. Um, you can see uh, when you tried to change that. This is the difference between just moving manure 
and moving separated solids, right? So we can start to look at different practices and realize your dollar per pound could go down $7 if you're trying to move separated solids as compared to liquid manure. Um, there's a million things to look at. I just want to give you an idea. This is never endingly complicated, right? Here's one of the scenarios where we had all of these uh, technologies that I could use and how much they cost. So there's a lot of assumptions that go into these things. And then you have outputs of, you know, we can do this within the state. The data is better when we can do it on that refined level. Um, but of course, that's tough to do for the whole state. So sometimes we're having to use bigger numbers. And the next steps are to integrate with the LCA and then also to, we're doing this also for landfill diversion of the organic waste. So I know that was like a stumble through. It's a kind of a messy project, but I don't think I have any.